when watching the interview we did with Yuri Besmanov, um, I wonder what stage we're at. Uh, right now, would you say at this point, there's obviously the point of demoralization, which is about 15 to 20 years, then the point of destabilization. I think we're well beyond that. I think you'll agree. And we're at the point of crisis, I would say. Would you agree with that? Is that a fair, is that a fair assessment? I certainly agree with that. Yeah. Yes, we, we are at the tail end of the crisis, and they're hoping to tip the scale and get us into um, uh, what normalization, <laughs> which is the normalization, as, as you and I both know, but maybe your listeners don't realize that when Yuri Bezmianov was explaining all this, remember Yuri was a, a defective, uh, not defective, but defector uh, KGB agent, and he, he knew this strategy very well. He'd studied it in Moscow. And normalization is when um, they bring the tanks into the streets and uh, crush whatever resistance there is left. And when all the opposition is either killed or uh, so fearful that they hide in their cellars and don't come out, then they say, comrades, uh, we now have uh, normalized the situation. <laughs> and uh, I like the way Yuri said that. So yes. Back to your question, I think it's sadly and grimly true that we certainly are in the at least the middle of the crisis stage, crisis stage, and they are hoping that very soon. I don't know what soon means in this case. Are we talking about months or years? But I think we're talking. I think we're talking about less than a couple of years. It could be much less than that. I think they hope to bring things to such a boil especially if they can do it with things like race war and things like that, or uh, pandemics where everybody is sick and they're told it's from a virus when in fact it's because they throw the switch and turn on all the 5G towers that they've been feverishly putting up everywhere. And a lot of people are going to find out that the 5G radiation creates illnesses very similar to the symptoms that you see with um, COVID-19. And they'll, all these people who get radiation sickness, they say, see, we told you the virus is back. And, you know, these things go on and on and on. And when people are so afraid and when people actually start dying of radiation sickness and illnesses in their neur neurological system, and it's, they're being told it's th the virus, they won't know any different. They'll think, oh, God, yes, we've got to lock ourselves down. We'll do exactly what we're told so we don't get this virus. But in spite of that, they're still dying. It'll be a terrible, terrible um, bubonic plague type of scenario. And you talk about crisis, nobody will ask about constitutional liberties. Nobody will ask about privacy. Nobody will worry about their safety, you know, or any, any, any constitutional issues or freedom issues is out the door. A drowning man is not interested in discussing, you know, constitutional liberties. He's just trying to breathe air. And that's where they want to get everybody to the stage where they feel like they are drowning and they just want to get to the surface and breathe. And yes, we will do anything and everything you tell us to do. Just save us in this moment of crisis. It's like that quote from Chaos Comes Order. That's kind of I, I, I didn't quite hear that. What was that? From chaos comes order. Chaos comes, yeah, peace, uh, like the peace of a cemetery. Yeah, order, like order in a prison. Yes, that's how it's, how it's exactly, that's a good description of it. Yeah. Now let's talk about um, your book that uh, most people, I would say, that know you, um, would know about the creature from Jekyll Island. So as we're seeing the monetary collapse of the financial system, it's like a house of cards, which is, bit, well, the process began quite some time ago, but like the first embers of a, a crumbling empire falling when its monetary system collapses. So I want to know what you think right now, the um, dollar going the way it's going, but also, um, on top of that, I would like to know where we're headed, like in terms of a, um, a digital dollar and where blockchain you feel, you know, is involved and can it be used for good or can it be used otherwise? Or is it going to be used by the powers that be that are 
going to use it for their own gain. I understand having to do in technology and cryptocurrencies. Is that, did I hear that? Yeah, correctly? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess by now everybody knows that I'm <laughs> quite contrarian in a lot of my views. Uh, certainly, um, you don't hear what I'm saying spoken on every street corner. So I hate to change the pattern. I'll just continue with that and say that um, I am not as enthusiastic about cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Well, the blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies really are two different topics. So that's something we got to get clear right at the beginning. Absolutely. The blockchain technology, I think, is brilliant. It's a, it's a masterful concept, and it can be used, as we know, for very good things. It'll make transactions much more transparent. It'll, it'll um, have a lot of benefits. I don't need to list them all because people have heard them over and over again. So I, I have nothing, uh, I have no problem with blockchain technology. I think it has a great use in the future of our world, and it will help It'll help uh, the common man it, if it's allowed to, but it also can be used for other purposes that aren't so, so meritorious. And so let's talk about that. The application of blockchain technology to money is something else. Just because the blockchain has a lot of virtue to it for transparency and, and uh, possibly for privacy, although that's kind of contradictory because nothing private about blockchain. It's all out in the open. Anybody can look at the, the ledger and see exactly everything that happened and who did it and when, how much was involved, and what time of the day. Everything is there. So uh, that in itself is neither, neither good nor bad, depending on your, whether you want transparency or whether you have the concept that you want certain things that are private and you just don't want it published to the world. I think humans are entitled to that. It doesn't mean that they have something to hide. It just mean that just means that I, I don't want I don't want NBC and CBS with the cameras on in my bathroom. Thank you. Uh, there are certain things uh, that I just I feel like I like my privacy. Thank you very much. And uh, so back to the thing. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we were told a story about this Nakam. Nakamoto, or I, I can never remember so how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mysterious person if he ever existed. I, I kind of prefer the scenario. I think it's more logical that that was not a person. I think this whole code was developed by a committee or a group, and uh, a well-funded, a well-funded group. And you can only imagine who that might be. But anyway, it's that's not important. There it is. Who who did it is not important. But it may be significant because if it was done, let's say, by the NSA, just as a possibility, you know that if it was done by any government agency, it wasn't for the benefit of the world. It was done for some advantage to the government or the ruling class that was really in charge of all of that, paying the bill. The military doesn't do anything for artistic reasons or because they want to improve education or health care. The military always does things in terms of how to defend against an enemy and how to control dissent at home. That's what the military is. That's all it's supposed to do and that's all it really does. So if it came from those sectors, we ought that even though it doesn't make any difference today, we, it's, a, it's a significant fact. And I don't know whether that's a fact or not, so let me be clear on that, but I suspect that it is. So putting that aside, so what? Um, what I have learned so much so far on this uh, is that, um, how shall I summarize this and keep from rambling, is, is that from the very beginning, and this can be established, this part is no longer theory or conjecture, from the very beginning, some of the largest banks in the world, international banks, when I say from the beginning, I mean from the very beginning of the introduction of blockchain technology to the public and possibly before then, long before I ever heard about it. Some of the largest international banks in the world were organizing and spending a huge amount of money to explore and develop cryptocurrency. They were not fighting it as the story goes. The, 
the public narrative is that, oh, the banks really didn't want to see, uh, did not want to see cryptocurrency, all this, they're fighting it, oh, they're afraid this is going to take away their power. Meanwhile, the banks, every one of them are spending millions of dollars and they've got buildings full of people working on the project and how to use the technology. So when I learned that that was true, then I thought, well, wait a minute, there's deception involved here. And whenever you find deception, you should slow way down and start to examine, well, why? What's the motive for deception? Well, it is, I, think, I think that the motive, obvious motive would be if the banks let the world know that they were really behind the development of cryptocurrency, well, then people would say, uh-oh, this is not something we want. But if they could promote the narrative that, well, the banks are afraid of this, and this is going to be the end of central banking. This is going to be the end of the dominance of these big bad bankers. Oh, it must be good. It must be good. I've seen that trick used a lot of times over history, and I thought, hmm, is that what's going on here? And then I, the more I learned since that point, the more I have reinforced the plausibility of that scenario. Um, first of all, I think we should recognize that the idea of a cashless society has been the dream, the beautiful dream of the banking system and oppressive governments, by the way, from the very beginning. The totalitarian governments and central bankers, all bankers, do not like money that people can hoard and have and protect and not report to the authorities. They just, they, that is, if you have your own money in the mattress or buried in a coffee can or in a, in a vault somewhere in, in, in a, across the land somewhere, if you have hidden money and people will recognize that money, you then can be independent of control. You now are an independent person. You have your own source of, of funding. You can buy things. But if you don't have money in your hand, if it has to be in some kind of a, an account at a bank, what do you have? It's all electronic. You cannot put it, you cannot put that, those digits <laughs> under your mattress. Mm. So now at you're dependent time, completely. At the same time, I would play devil's advocate a little bit and say, with the uh, cryptocurrencies, it's not necessarily held by a bank. You've got your own wallet, which essentially is like your own Swiss bank account in your own phone. That, that is true. You have your wallet. It's your means to access the digits. That is true. Um, but let me, uh, continuing the narrative, if that wallet should be turned off in some way, if, there's, if you could put an on-off switch to that wallet, and you think you control the wallet, you think you've got the only key to it, but what if you don't? What if, and okay, thank you for that, because now that's going to force me to pass through to the really critical part of this. What I've discovered in the last two years is that the, the banking system under the, the leadership of the IMF, International Monetary Fund, have been working feverishly developing a clearinghouse system through which all the cryptocurrencies of the world must be cleared through in order to make transactions anywhere in the world. The individual blockchains may have total autonomy and, and privacy, and you may not be able to crack them unless you've got a supercomputer or black back doors or something we don't know about. But they do have AI, and they can track those transactions, and they compare it with known patterns and known well, patterns would be the main thing, and it wouldn't take them very long, even with the present state of AI, to figure out exactly who and what is involved in every blockchain because they'll match it up with patterns outside of the blockchain. So the idea of privacy is really, it's not a very defensible concept, even at that level. But now, back to the IMF. You know, here in the United States, when we make out our tax forms, they ask us to, if we're in business uh, of our own, what kind of a profession are you in or a business? Uh, they say, put in your, your identification code for that business or that profession. And they have a big, long list. And you can look this list up. To, well, I'm a writer. What kind of a writer? You know, do you do fiction or nonfiction? And uh, okay, historical and so on. They know exactly what your profession is by a number. I'm, I'm, I think it's about nine or 12 digits long. So I've learned that the IMF 
is expanding on that system so that now there would be a number, I don't know how many digits long, it doesn't make any difference, might be, maybe it's a hundred digits, I don't know, but it'll be a number and it'll identify every act, every activity, every product, every product and every human activity that you can conceive of and that will be put into this cryptocurrency clearinghouse so that even though you've got let's say I form a cryptocurrency which I can do today and I've got a hundred people that are in my little community and we trade things among each other that is true and the, the system would not reveal who we are except through the AI uh, approach but if we wanted to buy a cup of coffee at the corner store or a gallon of gas or pay my rent or whatever but go on an airplane if we want to use the money for any kind of a transaction outside of our little group no don't worry folks we'd have this all worked out it goes through the clearinghouse We'll recognize any of your cryptocurrencies and um, just don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And even though you've got Ed Griffin's little unknown cryptocurrency, you can still buy uh, a house or a car or a cup of coffee with it because of this wonderful uh, clearinghouse that we've worked out. Everybody will love it. The only thing is that it goes through, now all of a sudden, it's not decentralized. It's centralized through the clearinghouse. Now, the significance of that is that not only can the system turn you off, cut you out of that, but they can also clear your account if they don't like you. They have access to your own, your own digital currency, and they can just, they take everything you have. If you are fined, let's say the government says you, you drove 85 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone, and that's going to cost you... Uh, Let's see, in the U.S. dollars, maybe it'll cost you $85 or $125 fine. You won't have to pay it. They'll just take it out of your, out of your crypto system through this clearinghouse. It'll just be gone. You'll say, oh, gee, what happened to my $125? Oh, well, that was your fine. If you owe taxes, you don't have to pay your taxes anymore. They'll just take it. They'll have an absolute right to it. So this is, now, this is the unhappy reality that I've discovered is that the banks love this system, and so do governments, because it's not the way it is now. They have plans for what it's going to be like five years from now and ten years from now. That's the goal. And if you only think about today, you don't see it. You have to realize the fact that they have been involved and, and heavily financially researching and trying to get into this field as quickly as possible, and they're not stupid. They have a long-range plan, and it's not to our benefit. Mm. I would like agree with much of that. Um, but at the same time, there are um, other privacy coins that I'm thinking along the lines of Monero or something like a Zcash, which bypass that. And the thing that annoys governments the most is that they can't get their hands on them simply because they are untraceable. What do you think? That's my count. Well, I was tr talking about that. They may be untraceable, but if you want to use them for really substantial commerce, then you've got to go through the clearinghouse. Otherwise, you're just stuck with the people, other people who have your same coin. Now, that, you could probably survive on that basis if you had a large enough community. But sooner or later, they would be traceable because of the AI that they could apply to these transactions. I think they would, wouldn't take very long, especially if you consider the development of AI into a five years in the future or something like that. It would be much more advanced and efficient than it is now. And I, I just don't... Um, I don't have the same confidence that I did in the beginning and the first time I heard about cryptocurrencies. I thought, oh my God, this is it at last. Oh, we've got, finally, we've got this defense and we can defend our liberties and our privacy. I, I don't have that confidence anymore. Um, what changed that for you exactly? Was there a moment where you kind of thought, well, actually, this is it, all it's cracked up to be? I'm, I'm not sure I heard that question. I meant, uh, what was oh, that? sorry, um, what made the, what changed that opinion for you? Um, what, what made you think this isn't quite cracked, it, wasn't, it isn't what it's quite cracked up to be? Well, because of the development I was trying to explain, the fact that the, the governments and the banks have been really the primary movers and shakers in the development of this technology. I mean, that's pretty obvious now, even though we can't, prove that the original code came from the NSA or someplace like that. It did come from some very well-funded uh, source and they had a lot of brain power, I think, committee, a group. I, it wasn't one person in my view. It's not logical. But anyway, and, and even if that weren't the case, I, I can see now from the present 
documentation in the news that, you know, Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank of America, Chase Manhattan, they're all, they're all um, look at their budgets. They're spending tens of millions of dollars developing cryptocurrencies of their own. Now that we have a, a U.S. dollar crypto that's being announced and everybody's so happy because now we can we can spend U.S. dollars. We can we can swap dollars for this U.S. crypto coin. And uh, so every month there's something that more goes into place that builds that edifice I was describing a moment ago. It is becoming more of a reality brick by brick. I mean, it starts off as theory and now we see a lot of bricks are in place. And so I, I see that structure being built. Mm. And um, do you personally um, have a, even though you're quite skeptical and you've like, um, aired your views, do you personally own any cryptocurrencies yourself? Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, absolutely. Just because I, I understand, or at least I think I understand where this is headed, that doesn't mean uh, I'm foolish enough not to uh, uh, own some cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, it's the old argument. It, it's right now cryptos are not being used for currency. I mean, it, it, to a very limited extent, but most people don't buy cryptocurrencies because they think they're going to buy something with it. They're just counting on the fact that it's going to go up in value. And they've heard about how much money others have made. And they say, well, I don't want to be left out of this. So it's a speculation right now, primarily, uh, with anticipation that maybe someday it'll become a currency. And it will become a currency. That's my point. But when it becomes a real currency that you can use in day-to-day -day transactions, then it'll no longer serve the function that we, we were interested in it in the, for in the first place. So yes, I have some, and I uh, my my theory is that yes, this is the it's coming. You can't ignore it. Uh, you're going to participate in it whether you like it or not, because the day may come. I'm afraid it may come that you won't have any choice. You're going to be in crypto, or or you'll be in the black market with gold and silver coins, which I think most many people will be. You can count on it. I will be, and uh, and that'll be something you can put in your mattress or under your pillow or in a coffee can, even though the system will force you to be a criminal in order to do it. Mm. Well, the signs are already there because we already have stable coins like Tether, which essentially acts like a US dollar, you know, it's a USDT. So, you know, if that doesn't say, tell you something, then I'm missing something big, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I agree with that. Yes, I, I do have cryptos, and uh, I, I also am in, in the market because of speculation. I think, uh, you know, I have some money that I, I can afford to lose, not a lot of it, but I think, well, let's see where this goes. And my strategy on that is, is not to just uh, hodl it, let, let, let it go and see where it goes, because if the purchasing power of my, of my cryptos uh, goes up significantly, um, my strategy is just to take... Uh, a significant chunk, maybe half of it out, and convert it into tangibles like silver. I think silver is a great place to put it. Or maybe there are other places there are. Um, I don't want everything riding in the ether. Mm, or Ethereum for that matter. <laughs> Pardon the pun. <laughs> 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 okay, um, let's move on and talk about um, Red Pill University. Um, what um, made you um, set that up and found it? And um, what is its objective? I hope you forgive me. You've already discovered that I can't answer a question without backing up and getting a run on it. <laughs> because, <there's, laughs> because sometimes the answers don't make much sense if you just say yes or no, or you, you simplify it. Because it's, it's the learning experience and the rationale, the strategy behind a decision, I think that is more important than the decision itself. The decision may be wrong, but if the thinking that goes into the decision is good, then it, even if your decision is wrong, you'll be able to make the correct decision more quickly because your fu fundamentals are primarily correct. So, um, what made me do that? What made me do that is that I've spent my life since 1960, a long time ago, dealing with the issues that I've talked about earlier, which is the destruction of, of a free society and the gradual conversion of a great nation, not a perfect one, but a great nation with, with a lot of 
liberty for its people and freedom and opportunity and tolerance and compassion. Convert that kind of a social and political system into hell. What the hell is going on was your question. That is what's going on. And so I, um, I became concerned over that. And for probably the first 20 years after that, uh, my mission as a crusader, I, I, I found that I had a crusader uh, uh, gene in me, and I just couldn't help it. I, I had to spread the word, and I had to try and do something about it, not just talk about it, not just say, my goodness, isn't that terrible? I wonder what's going to happen next. I had to be a participant. So for the, for the next 20 years, my level of participation was to sound the alarm, to tell the people what was going on, to explain it to them, to show the documentation, to rally the troops, so to speak. And then I came to the point where I realized that just knowing about these things wasn't enough. What are you going to do about it? It's not enough to say, tsk, tsk, this is terrible. Look, how, look what they're doing. We must stop them. Write your congressman. What a joke that is. Right, my congressman. My congressman is the problem in most cases. Write to your senator. Elect the right president. Oh my gosh. We, what is a, I mean, in America, we've had, you know, we have two, two branches of the same political party pretending to be two political parties. And we've gone from Republican to Democrat to Republican to Democrat, back and forth, back and forth, always getting rid of the scoundrels, replacing with new heroes, and they turn out to be scoundrels. This has been going on and on and on and on. Yeah, get a new president in there. Let's believe them when they tell you, we're going to put an end to war. All of our presidents have told us that. And the minute they're in office, they increase the military budget and they expand the wars. I mean, that's just one example. So I suddenly realized this, all this business about right your congressman. Sign the petition. Let them know that you don't want them to do that. And it dawned on me, I, I missed the final step. Yes, information is essential. I mean, if you take action without knowing what's going on, you're going to do the wrong thing. But if you don't take action at all, it's probably better than doing the wrong thing. And I realized that we had to have an action plan and we had to know what it is we wanted with as much passion as we knew what we didn't want. In America, and I suppose in most countries of the world where they have the semblance of voting at least, the voters don't vote for a candidate that they like. They vote against the candidate they hate. It's seldom, it's very seldom that you find a candidate that a rational, well-informed person who knows what's going on in the world will say, boy, that guy is really solid. They'll just say, well, I'm not so sure about him, but look at this other guy. I mean, God, we got to get rid of them or else we're through. So always our presidents, our congressmen, our senators, our political parties, they're always put into office because of the horrible record of the previous ones in power. And I decided this, at this point in my development that it was not enough to say, now that you know about things, go to the polls and vote. <laughs> vote for whom? Yeah, well, vote for one of the two candidates that your enemies have selected for you to choose between. That's where that ends. You see where I'm going with this. And I got, got to this, this red pill moment in my life where I realized that everything I've been suggesting that people do is a waste of time because it won't produce any results. And no wonder, no wonder they hadn't come after me for spreading the truth is because so what? They didn't see me as a threat. And a lot of people were spreading the truth. It's only when you start to threaten their hold on society, get into the political arena and make a change so you don't go for those usual paradigms of left versus right. The whole left-right paradigm is phony. And as long as, as long as you play the left-right game, they don't care because whether the so-called right wing or the so-called left wing is in power, the nation continues to go in the same direction. Have you noticed? Yes. So as long as you play that game, you're, you're okay. When you step out of that 
that game. And you say, I'm not playing that game anymore. I'm not going to talk about liberals uh, versus conservatives. I'm not going to talk about communists versus uh, capitalists or socialists. I'm not going to talk about left versus right and all of these things. I'm going to talk about principles which are individualism versus collectivism. All of these systems, fascism, socialism, Nazism, New Dealism, uh, all, of, all of these things, communism, they're variants of this thing called collectivism. They're all the same once you peel the label off. And here we are putting people who believe essentially the same thing into office, even though they shout at each other and they argue on things, but when, once they're in office, they believe the same thing and the nation continues to go. Okay, I've made that point. Now, so what do you do? How do you change the system? And I realized that the way you change it and recapture the system is the same way we lost it. That may not sound very profound to most people, but because they don't know how we lost it. I do. It took me a long time to analyze it, but we lost it because we were arguing over words like left versus right, communism versus socialism, Nazism, and so forth. And we didn't really understood what we wanted. We knew what we didn't want. Most of our time in a conversation was, oh, we hate this, we gotta avoid that. Look out over there and let's find somebody to, to be our hero. We don't ask what he believes as long as he says the right things. We don't check into his character or his background, his voting record, or who his friends are, what of his associations, what he's done in his life. We just say, oh, he mentioned the constitution. He's gotta be a good guy, so we'll vote for him. Or he mentioned, oh, we're going to stop illegal immigration, and we vote for him, but once he's in office, we've got more illegal immigration. And we're going to vote for him because they said, we've got to stop violence in the street. And yet, he doesn't put the police or the National Guard into the street to stop it. He waits until it's so bad, now we've got to have martial law, which is, of course, the end game. I'm tired of that. I was tired of that a long time ago. So I decided that we had to come to power, if you might put it that way, the same we went out of power. The American people lost control of their, of their system about a hundred years ago. When we installed central banking, which took over our monetary system, and we allowed the collectivists to take over our educational system and start to teach our children in school, that collectivism was the ideology that they should hold. That was the point we lost our country. It was just a question of time now. And we've seen, as Yuri Bezmenov explained, we've seen this, this process going on a couple of generations now, now three generations, four generations, and we've lost it to all the young people. And so now it's even the older folks, the mature people, who are collectivists in their thinking. Now, they, you can get them riled up about action in the street, you can say, well, you know, environmentalism is, is, is phony and all that. Oh, yeah, that, they're just lying about that. But meanwhile, what are the solutions they go for? Collectivism. They want the government to take care of everything. And they don't realize that that's the enemy. It's the idea of collectivism that the government has got to be a pyramid and control our lives for our own good. That's the real enemy. Take those words off. So we lost because our enemies took over our system quietly from the inside. They used that wolf in sheep's clothing strategy that I mentioned earlier that was advocated by the Fabian Society. We were taken over quietly. The revolution happened without it firing a single shot and we lost the second American revolution. In order to have a third American Revolution, and I'm talking about America, but this applies to the world as well. We've got to retake our freedoms, our liberties, the same way we lost them. We've got to get rid of the central banking concept over our money. We've got to get rid of control over human beings through their money. That's number one. And we have to re-educate, not just the school children, but the old graduates as well, that collectivism is not the answer to these things. That's individualism, that is. And in order to do that, we then have to put people into positions of authority in the school system, in government agencies, in labor unions, in the media, everywhere, just like our enemies did. 
that little 1% that always leads every group, they're led by 1% or less, our enemies captured those 1% of all the power centers of society, and the other 99 are flapping around like a, like a fish on the bottom of a rowboat. We don't know what's going on. So we know what the strategy is, is to retake the power centers of society, not by guns and violence and bayonets and bombs, but through working in organizations like our enemies have done. And in order to do that, we have to have an organization. We have to have a strategy. We have to have leadership and principles. And that is why I formed Freedom Force International. Freedom Force International was an organization, still is, of that little 1% or less of the population who read books, people who are thinkers, people who can be and want to be thought leaders, people who feel a responsibility for their nation and for their country and for their world and for their fellow human beings everywhere. And they want to do something about it. We built that. We built that quite a while ago. And then the next stage in realization was, well, okay, here we are, this little half of 1% or whatever it is, that's our goal. But we need the people to follow. We need to influence them. So that's where we have to use this formula of going into the power centers of society and offer ourselves for positions of leadership. We've got to get out of the home. People say, oh, I don't want to go into politics. That's dirty. I hate politicians. And so they do nothing and let all the crumb bums become the politicians. And they have the power. They direct the police and the military. And we say, what happened to us? It's because we didn't, we didn't want to get into the battle. We've got to stop that, I said to myself. We've got to get into politics, even though we hate the, we hate, we hate the scene. We've got to take principles into politics. We've got to get into the media. We've got to get back into the schools. We've got to do all the things in reverse to reverse the ways in which we lost control of our system. And so well, that means we have to reach out to more than just the 1%. That's what the 1% has to do. Reach out to the, to the next 15% and those then reach out to the rest. And so I thought and thought and thought, we need something which is a little less scholarly than all this reading of books these principles we're talking about can be stated in very simple terms. And so I was thinking about the red pill. Almost everything that we're concerned about can be expressed in terms of the fact that the people have been fooled. They see an illusion. But if they take the red pill and see reality, they'll break out of the illusion. They realize they've been had. They've been messed with. They've been plundered. And they're being enslaved thinking it was all for their own good and their own safety. So I thought maybe this is a way to reach out to larger numbers of people with the simple common denominator of that message. And we gave it a try with the Red Pill Expo. It was back in 2017. And it was a smashing success. We've had four of them since then, five of them since then. We were scheduled for the next one, which already passed. We had to cancel it because it was scheduled to be on Jekyll Island, <laughs> it was supposed to be this month, the first part of this month. Well, then along came the coronavirus theater and everybody got locked down for, well, we don't, that's another topic. And so we had to cancel that. But we've rescheduled it for November. And it's our intent to hold the next Red Pill Expo on Jekyll Island in November. In case a lot of your listeners and readers and viewers don't know, Jekyll Island was in my title of my book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve. Jekyll Island Federal Reserve was concocted back in 1910 and a secret meeting that took place there. So there's a lot of history on Jekyll Island. And we thought we'd go back and just sort of thumb our noses at the founders of the Federal Reserve System and say, we're back. And this time we're going to retake the system. It's kind of a symbolic gesture of defiance. And people were very excited about that, and they still are. That's our next move. But then the next step, and I'll finally close this off, is we realize that Red Pill Expos, where we get a lot of very top talent people, people who come from the highest levels in their professions, in all fields, talk about the Red Pill that they took and explaining it to us so that we can not have so much pain and learning about these things like, that, like they did. Uh, so we realized that as powerful as that is, it's only one day a year. And then we bumped it up to two times a year. But even that, we need to do red pilling every day of the year. So that's when the idea of Red Pill University came into view. So we created that 
uh, about three years ago, and now it is really ramping up, and this is where people can start on this journey, as you mentioned, your own journey. The next step, if you want to get into that part of the picture where we decide knowing is not enough, doing is everything. If you're ready for that step, I'm going to close off this simply by saying, please come to the redpilluniversity.org. Redpilluniversity.org. Start your journey there, and that is where we have a chance, the only chance, in my view, of recapturing the system. I'm glad you mentioned that because I will also put the link below for in the description for our viewers as well. But I'm glad you mentioned fight backs and positives because um, I wonder what your opinion is on things like um, Donald Trump taking over the Federal Reserve and merging it with the Treasury and trying to bankrupt the Federal Reserve essentially and um, movements such as QAnon. I want to know what your thoughts are on them. <laughs> Well, I'm not very very popular on that topic because I I don't really see that as genuine. I don't really see that as being genuine. I think there's one of the biggest red pills that we have to take. Uh, first of all, <laughs> the idea that Donald Trump or anybody is going to take over the Federal Reserve. I mean, Donald Trump wouldn't be where he is if he didn't have the blessings of the Federal Reserve. Uh, whoever started that rumor or that idea was pretty smart because it's kind of like the QAnon approach. Don't worry about it, folks. Uh, there are people at the top that we can trust. Yes, there are some white hats and you don't have to get involved. You don't have to do anything because we, we're on the inside and we can tell you that big things are happening. So don't worry. It's okay. It's a great strategy. I, I don't know who dreams these things up, but I can tell you it's not in our best interest. Donald Trump, uh, is, um, in my view, uh, he's a servant of the Federal Reserve. Look at the people he promotes and the people he's put into his cabinet and um, all of that. And he, he, he's, uh, he's pretty good at uh, saying the right things and does a few good things, but then they get undone very quickly. And you back off and look at the whole picture and it's, the, it's not any different than it's ever been. Under Donald Trump, we've continued to do everything we did under Obama, and under Obama, we did everything we did under the Bushes and so forth. It's just, the pattern really hasn't changed. What comes out of the pipe has not changed. Mm. And um, as for the kind of fight back of the people, I've noticed there are, you know, there are people in America, I think there, there's some so like staying with fight backs and, you know, there seems to be more people than that of, you know, of what inflation is, of what, how the system works. What will it take for us to, you know, like, because in my view, it's not too late to turn this around, but in, enough people, and they don't have to be a majority, have to be, you know, well-informed, you know, well-read and like know how this works. So what does it take for us to turn this around, to turn the tide around? Well, the answer to that question, I think, is pretty much what I was taking too long a moment ago to explain, is that you can't turn it around just by promoting an idea, like a flat tax or something like that. Uh, this, I, did, if I understood you correctly, did you mention a flat tax as one of the things we might do? Is that how I heard that? Um, no, I had to fight back to turn the tide around of where we're going. Oh, oh okay. One All world right. government and one world uh, currency. Well, okay. The answer is that it won't happen quickly. And, and it, it's not just who you're going to vote for, what party is going to be in office, or what man on the white horse are you going to put in, into the top position. Our opponents have grabbed hold of our whole system, our economy, our social system, our school system, our media, our labor unions, everything. They have, if you look at almost every organization that has any influence on determining the political destiny of the nation, all the big powerhouses, the international corporations, the banks, the nonprofit organizations, the educational institutions, you know, all of those things, take a few hours and look at the boards of directors of those people and the people who are in the executive positions you will be shocked 
to find out what a high concentration there is at that level of people who are really dyed in the wool collectivists. I mean, they're not just going along with it. They are advocates. And they're advocates of not only collectivism, but global collectivism. They're advocates of the absolute elimination of national sovereignty and the conversion of this whole world into a single unified government that they fondly call the New World Order. And you find these people, these advocates, at the heads of all of these uh, systems that I'm talking about, the, you know, the, all of these organizations which are determining the fate of the country. Now, if you think you're going to change the, the direction of the country simply by voting for somebody, you've missed the boat because this thing is bigger than that. Our approach has to be, it has to start at the grassroots level, which is one of the reasons at Red Pill University, our concept is to create a campus. Here in the United States, the plan, we're put, trying to put campuses in every county in the United States. And in some of the large counties, we'll have several campuses. That would translate into any country of the world, depending on their geographical subdivisions of what those political units are. We've got to start changing the members of the city council. We've got to have a mayor in place that, for example, is not going to order the police to stand down while looters and rioters burn every place. We, we're not, we can't afford to have governors who do the same thing. And you don't do that at the national level. You've got to start from the lower level and build up. And it takes time. So there's no single motion, sign this petition or institute that plan or something. No, this is uh, the problem here and the challenge is to, to retake the whole system from the ground up. That's how we've lost it, from the ground up. It wasn't just one proposal or one person or one party. So unfortunately, the answer is that there is no quick solution. People like the idea of, well, who are we going to vote for at the next election? Because if we get the right person here in the States, we say, if we get the right person in the White House, well, then all this will go away. No, not at all. First of all, your chances of getting the right person in the office are pretty, pretty uh, slim, considering that all the candidates are chosen by those hidden financial forces that we were talking about earlier. And so you have a choice between Tweedledee and Tweedledum, even though they sound different and fight each other. Uh, I think when I was a boy, I remember when television first came out, my grandmother had one of the first television sets. And uh, in the afternoon, she would always watch professional wrestling. Here's my grandmother watching professional, professional wrestling. And she gets all excited because, you know, there was usually pretty clear who you had to root for. Root for. There's the, the nice guy with the wavy blonde hair and the American flag, maybe his, his, his uh, briefs are like the USA. And then the other guy, he's, he's got a snarl, he's all unshaven, his hair is messy, he's got tattoos, maybe a swastika on his shoulder or something, and they're wrestling each other, right? Well, you know who my grandmother's going to be rooting for. And so and she's like, look out behind you! And she's taking this so seriously. What she didn't realize, and what I didn't realize at the time, was that both of these guys are probably working for the same manager. And they were told, okay, this is, now you get in there and, and slam the heck out of each other and really, come on, guys, mix it up. Throw somebody out of the ring, hurt them. You know, you guys are going to get hurt. That's what you're getting paid for. And so they go out and they have put on one heck of a fight. But of course, the guy with the stars and stripes always wins. And the, sn the snarly guy gets defeated. And my grandmother would watch that week after week after week. And she never figured out that it was all a phony wrestling match. I mention that because the American voters, I think, are the same way. They go from election after election and after election, and they always vote for the guy that has the worst opponent. Think about that. I think that the key to political victory in the world today is not selecting an attractive candidate, but making sure that your man that you want in an office has the worst possible opposition that you can buy so that people will be so afraid and so, uh, uh, so outraged by this person's opponent that they will vote for him. Having said that, I think you get a pretty good idea of how I feel about 
taking politicians too seriously, especially if they don't have a, record, a long record of proving that what they're now saying is something they really believe. Yeah, that's so well put. And um, to wrap this up, because it's been over an hour now, um, but I, if I had it my way, I'd have it much, much longer. But is there anything else that you'd like to add at all? No, except I hope you forgive me for being so so honest and so uh, non diplomatic in my answers to the questions. But I, I feel that the best thing I can do at my stage in life is just to be totally honest. When people ask me what I think, I I should preface by saying um, I reserve the right to be wrong. But here's what I think. You know, I should always put that that <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that's how I actually, uh, how I feel. I'm not saying that 100% that everything I have said is I know to be a fact. But I've had a lot of experience and I've seen a lot of phony wrestling matches over the years. And I just, I just think I can smell it a mile away. So anyway, I apologize if what I've said is not pleasant, uh, but I do think it's the truth. And so thanks for listening and I hope you'll give it some consideration. And if you think in your heart that this, this guy might be onto something and you want to do something about it. I urge you, please, to come to Red Pill University and begin your journey there. And if people want to reach out to you or go to Red Pill University, how can they go about that? Well, I'm pretty visible at Red Pill University now. Um, we, we're putting up a lot of great video presentations on issues related to what we're talk, talking about. Um, I'm working around the clock getting these, vetting these uh, presentations and getting them up. And uh, to my um, surprise and to my great pleasure, I find that these videos are, are triggering comments from viewers. I never realized how many people were looking at my stuff. <laughs> and, but now I go in and look under comments and two or three times a day, there's 20 or 30 comments that, that have come in and uh, most of them are favorable, some of them are not favorable at all, and some of them trigger uh, responses. So I'm getting involved in a give and take kind of a relationship with a lot of the viewers and I enjoy doing it. And it's, it's very uh, rewarding to me to see so many people deeply understanding these issues and asking really good questions. And challenging me, too. I, I enjoyed being challenged. And every once in a while, I have to think, hmm, gosh, I hadn't thought about that one. I think they got me on that. And then I'll go in and say, okay, you win on this one, and thank you. And uh, it's, it's invigorating. It's how I learn, is to be challenged. And um, so, having said that, I'm going to say, if you want to uh, engage me, uh, that's a good place to start. And if you have something to say, uh, I can't answer everybody because there are just too many, but something really meaty and something that would be of interest to a lot of people. Uh, let's start there at Red Pill University. You heard him, viewers. If you want to get on him, you know where to go. Um, Mr. G. Edward Griffin, once again, it was everything I could have hoped for and so much more. And I'm, I'm sure our viewers will be absolutely enamored by everything you've said over the last hour. So once again, I thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, thank you. And good luck to you there in the UK. And I know you got similar, similar challenges there. And maybe you and I <laughs> work, <laughs> you and I together, maybe we can change the world. I can't think of any better partner and I wouldn't have it any other way. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.